Good morning, everybody, again. And uh, apologies, but what would be a virtual meeting without small technical difficulties in the beginning? My name is Britta Siegmund, and together with Dominic Müller, we are currently the interim director of the BIH Charité Clinician Scientist Program. A very warm welcome to everybody. We are celebrating today and tomorrow the 10th anniversary of the BIH Charité Clinician Scientist Program. And we are doing so in honor and memory of Dushka Dragoon. And before we start discussing what the political role and the meaning of those programs for German University Medicine is, and before we touch science, we dedicate our first session to Dushka. And for this reason, I would like to welcome a number of people personally. First, up front and most important, I'd like to send very warm welcomes to Zagreb, to Dushka's family and friends, and also very warm welcome to the Netherlands, to Tanja and to Igor here in Berlin. The four people, probably the most important people in the last year of Dushka's life. The other the other, well, the other interest of Dushka, besides the clinician scientist program, was nephrology, and here in particular, transplant nephrology. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to, to welcome this morning three very important people for her in, in this field. And this is, first of all, Professor Haller from the medical school in Hanover, an early mentor of Dushka. This is Professor K Toby Coates, Good evening, Toby, from Australia, who is uh, a transplant, um, a renal transplant uh, person and a personal friend and nephrologist, Tobias Huber, from the Universitätsklinikum Hamburg-Eppendorf. Good morning, Toby. I also like to welcome from, from Charité side, Professor Bries, our dean, who is already with us. I'd like to welcome Professor Kreis, our medical director. I also uh, like to welcome Frau Runo from the BIH. Professor Baum will join us tomorrow morning. Professor Krömer will join us later today. It's my real pleasure to welcome our first BIH director, Professor Ernst Rietschel. Good morning, Ernst. It's our real pleasure to have you with us here today and to, for in particular for this session dedicated to Dushka. We also, the program would not have been possible with strong support from funding bodies in particular over the first years. And for this, I'd like to welcome the representatives of the VW Foundation as well as of the Stiftung Charité for the support for the VW Foundation in the early days and for the Stiftung Charité for the support over basically the entire time. In addition, I'd like to welcome the representatives of the German Research Foundation, which are currently funding our digital clinician scientist track. Another support that was really important over the last decade is the support by the Berlin Chamber of Physicians. Günther Jonitz was here the most important person over this decade who is not able to join us this morning. But it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Bobbert, who is one of our very first clinician scientists and is the newly elected president of the Berlin Chamber of Physicians. Warm welcome, Peter. I also like to welcome now uh, a couple of other guests who, who, um, who, who are with us this morning, and these are members of the federal parliament, members of the federal ministry of education and research, as well as Professor Frosch and Dr. Wissing from the Medizinischen Fakultätentag, as well as all friends and colleagues of Duschka. But also, and last but absolutely not least, I'd like to welcome uh, Dushka's team, as well as our newly elected junior and clinician scientists, the current member of our program, of the clinician scientist program, and all our uh, alumni, as well as the uh, clinical directors and scientific members, uh, which are supporting the entire um, program. 
what I d probably during the waiting phase, you already explored our, our platform and you have realized that there is a, a memorial room. The insiders will immediately recognize where this is. This is a very special room in the castle uh, Genshagen. We are coming back to the castle Genshagen throughout this morning uh, session. So feel free to explore this uh, memorial room. And I think for the other points that you can explore on this website we will introduce um, later on. With this, I wish us a very, um, a very uh, good meeting um, in honor of Dushka. And I would like to, to hand over for a, for a welcome to Professor Bries, our dean from the Charité here in Berlin. Professor Bries. Yeah, dear uh, Professor Sigmund, dear guests, um, I'm uh, very honored to introduce this um, outstanding symposium for Dushka Dragoon. And I would like to um, show you two slides if the, if the organizer allows me to. Um, Dushka was a um, person extremely devoted to the clinician scientist program. And the clinician scientist program started about uh, 10 years ago. And there were, were many necessary to make it to the success which we can see today and which we will hear about today and tomorrow. It's, it started, as I said, uh, roughly in 2011. And at the time, uh, one of the really major steps was to combine the duties for the young um, um, talents in, in the medical and scientific, uh, scientific field to, to allow them to combine their duty in their medical specialization as well as in their scientific uh, career development. And this was done in a very ingenious way and it uh, uh, we <clears throat> required a lot of attention to the individual career building, a, um, very good counseling and so on and so forth. And based on, on these achievements, she developed a, a very comprehensive program um, for the clinician scientists. But uh, um, later on, it was diversified in different flavors in the young clinician scientists, in the clinician scientists, advanced, advanced clinician scientists, a digital program, um, also, we are looking forward to a medical scientist program and so on and so forth. So, um, this would not without the relentless effort of uh, Dushka and her group and the support by many others who are present today. And I think it's fair to say that this has changed the landscape in Germany for for the medical research because uh, increasingly it's a problem of um, medical practice and medical research uh, going different routes and um, it's needed to address the medical need to, to bring it together. And for, for this effort and for this success, we all owe Dushka um, very many thanks and um, the outstanding symposium today and tomorrow shows very clearly how much the community is valuing her contribution and how relevant um, the area where she was active um, actually was. Um, with my great thanks to Dushka, um, um, the regards to the family and to all her friends and colleagues I hand over back to um, uh, the team, and I think the next one will be Jürgen Zellner. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bries, for the, for the warm welcome. And in fact, Dr. Lottmann will be the next who will, uh, who will give us a warm welcome from side of the Stiftung Charité. Dr. Lottmann. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor Siegmund, Professor Bries relatives and friends of Dushka Dragoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, really my honor to speak to you today on this very uh, special occasion. Um, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 
the clinician scientist program started, was born. And I was not part of the Stiftung Charité back then, but I found some nice evidence, I think, of the yes, in our foundation archives. And I would like to share just one example with you, if that's technically possible. Um, otherwise, I can show it in the camera, because it's just a very plain document, I think. Um, it might be one of the very first documents, or let's say it's one of the very early sonographic images of this clinician scientist program as an unborn baby. And as you can see from the date, it's dated on, let me see, in August 2009, it is one of the first, maybe the first draft of the clinician scientist program developed by a group of highly ambitious and innovative scientists uh, at the shop. And among them, Dushka Dragoon is one of the leading, if not the leading voice. And the Stiftung Charité also made its contributions, I guess, not only in terms of funding, hopefully, but also by ideas, know-how, and encouragement. And let me please quote from this proposal so that you can see that it was not as plain, as colorless as the cover sheet might appear. Um, I will try. Yeah, I hope you can see it yourself here, read it yourself too, otherwise I will quote. In Germany, there is currently no differentiation among physicians in training in university affiliated programs who desire to pursue academic careers as translational or clinical scientists and those who aim for an administrative leadership at non-academic hospitals or strive to engage in business endeavors. So this proposal focuses on the clinical scientist career path and the resulting new culture of management of clinical services would be a meaningful achievement. It has the potential to turn Germany into a more attractive training site for future biomedical leaders and thereby supporting German ac academic medicine in its quest to regain a prominent position in the international biomedical community. And end of quote. Well, we all know, I think, that applications for funding usually sound very advertising and promise too much here and there sometimes. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. Who really believed at that time that this idea could not only help a few chosen charity physicians to better combine their residency training and their academic ambitions, but that it had the potential to strongly impact the general consistency of patient care on the one hand and clinical research on the other. That this idea could reduce the dropout of young physicians from, from the scientific track uh, due to the double burden as mentioned and due to the fact that the off-duty research uh, in, the, in the evening was no longer attractive and no longer up-to-date. That this idea had the potential to implement a whole new category of scholars and all that not only in Berlin but far beyond. Who really believed that? However, I think that is what really happened. To make a long story short, this proposal here was acknowledged and funded by the Volkswagen Foundation and the Stiftung Charité, and the first eight participants started in 2010, 2011. And only a few years later, building on the very positive experience of the first, first cohort, the program was permanently established and expanded. The number of clinician scientists grew steadily, thanks to additional support by the Charité, the Berlin Institute of Health, and several third-party funds. And that's not all. In recent years, important agencies such as the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the um, German Research Foundation, and the Wissenschaftsrat have highlighted the Berlin program in their policy panel to be followed nationwide. And indeed, since then, more and more university medicine locations in Germany have set up similar, very similar clinician scientist programs and thereby transformed, and let's say it clearly improved, the career system in the field of the life and medical sciences. I know that some of you are able to reflect in much greater detail on this progress, and I'm sure and hope that we will have the chance to hear and talk about uh, it during uh, this conference. However, on the whole, I think and hope we can say without necessarily blushing, this was and this is a real success story. 
My sincere congratulations to all of you who have made this possible, the originators and pioneers from the beginning, and here, without doubt, Dushka Dragoon, with all of her expertise and passion uh, in the first place, the funders and enablers then and now, the decision makers and board members, the management team, and last but not least, of course, the clinician scientists themselves. You have built something that is very important, not only for the Charité and the life sciences in Berlin, but for the medical faculties and university hospitals in Germany. And I'm pretty sure uh, that the story is not yet finished. There are new approaches, good ideas on how to further develop and enhance the clinician scientist program and the career system for clinician scientists in general. The Stiftung Charité will be happy to remain your strong partner and supporter. I'm already looking forward to that. But for now, happy birthday. I hope we will have a good conference in fond memory of Dushka Dragoon. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lottmann, for this very nice, very nice welcome uh, notice. And with this, we move to the early days of Dushka. And I welcome again Professor Haller from the medical school in Hanover, who really was one of the early significant persons for Dushka in, his, uh, in, her, in her life. Professor Haller. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, about Duska in our time together. Thank you very much, Dominic, for the invitation. And thank you very much, Dr. Siegmund. Uh, my name is Herman Heller. I was uh, a young assistant in nephrology at the Klinikum Stieglitz, what it was called in the 80s. And then I moved with Detlef Gunten and Friedrich Luft to the uh, east side of Berlin, and we started at the, in 1992 under the leadership of Friedrich Luft. And Duska joined my research group shortly thereafter. It was around 1993, 1994, that this young student from Croatia was introduced. Uh, she had applied to our program. She came with a stipend from Croatia and she started furiously. We worked at the time with new methods. We had developed a protocol to use antisense strategies uh, for kidney disease. And Dushka joined in. She took care of the rats. She operated on rats. We started kidney transplantation. And we had our first paper together still with me as first author in 1994. And uh, two years later, 1996, uh, she published her first paper on ICAM antisense uh, anti-adhesion molecule strategies in kidney transplantation. And I still remember vividly how proud we were about the pictures we obtained together with the group at the time uh, Friedrich Luft helped us to write the papers and uh, we were seriously productive. We have uh, also fun together. I wanted to share with you some pictures of canoe trips and you would have seen Dominic Müller with uh, not grayish but dark curls. Uh, Friedrich Luft and most of uh, most importantly Duska while we are in our canoes on the Brandenburg lakes with a very enthusiastic group of people at that time. Dushka then published several papers uh, on antisense strategies. She developed new methods to look into chronic transplant uh, problems. She collaborated with the surgical department uh, and uh, members of this department who are now in Boston still remember the interactions with Dushka vividly. Our last paper we published together was in 2001. At that time, Dushka already had left the Franz Vollhardt Clinic, me too. I was in Hanover uh, in nephrology and transplantation and Dushka, Dushka joined the department of Hans Helmut Neumeyer at the Charité, but nonetheless, our last paper together in 2001. And at that time already, both of us had already embarked on other aspects of academic life. 
Dushka started to think about uh, a clinician scientist program. I started a clinician scientist program with the EFB at uh, Hanover Medical School. And uh, it's not by accident that the two programs, the Berlin program and the Hanover program share a lot of features. And this is because it all goes back to Friedrich Luft. Friedrich Luft was the role model, both for me and for Duska as a clinician scientist. Enthusiastic in research, a wonderful clinician caring for patients, and at the same time being interested in molecular and genetic mechanisms of disease. This is what a clinician scientist program is all about. And this is what the people share who are embarking on this uh, wonderful journey of becoming a clinician scientist. So Dushka was a fighter. It was not easy and we've already heard about that to establish the program. And I have to admit it was not easy for her to establish her research in Germany. She brought a lot of energy. She brought a lot of liveliness to our research group. Uh, she was not always easy to work with, but she was forceful and it was a pleasure to have her around. She also brought life to science. It was not only the lab, but she was interested in life and the lab. And uh, I have wonderful memories and this seminar, this opportunity uh, brings back these memories and it has been a pleasure and uh, to think about Dushka again, to remind me of what we shared, uh, what I owe to her, her enthusiasm, her liveliness and uh, how forceful she translated science into medicine. We miss her. I miss her during meetings. I miss her energy. Uh, unfortunately, I have not met her parents, but uh, she will be with us uh, for a long time, both as a scientist and her publications and as a mentor and translating science into clinical medicine. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about her. And with that, I think I hand over to Dr. Siegmund. Yes. Thank you, Professor Haller, for this very nice summary, which is which I think is a perfect description of Dushka and how we how we uh, how we have her in in our memory. What I'd like to do now is to go back the last the last decade. And, and summarize how everything started and what developed out of this first thought. So we start and we have this timeline here in front of us when Charité was coming together and the different camp campus of Charité were trying to get to know each other. And at this time, a small group of young, enthusiastic scientists gathered and the group was called Académie der Jungen Charité. And this group included junior professors, Eminöter fellows, Max Eder fellows, BMBF junior group leaders. And this, this group was a very active group, hot discussions, very nice barbecues, and a, a lot of topics were, were discussed inside and outside of university medicine. But this group um, wrote in 2006 a concept paper of the Académie der Jungen Charité, and, and many thanks to Achim Kramer, who actually was able to find this document in his, on his computer again and, and provided this to me because I couldn't, I couldn't find it. And I'd just like to cite a couple of things we discussed at this time point, who, looking back, are not that different what we probably would have written today, and, but at this time were quite revolutionary. And I tried to translate them, so what we aim to achieve, we wanted to attract young scientists, excellent scientists to the Charité. We wanted to support heads, but not clusters. 
And I like the third point the most, uh, looking at it from today. We wanted a free science environment, door to door with creative hats, what we called an ordinarian freier Raum. So a room without uh, uh, directors who would tell us what, what to do. And, and this was important for the Charité at this time because really the, the, the different campus really needed to, to get to know each other. We wanted to improve communication, collaboration between sites and institutions. How do we want it to implement uh, this? Obviously active recruitment, common space and implementation of the strategy in the overall strategy of Charité at this time. And who was member and all junior scientists with independent third party funding should become uh, members of this Junge Charité. So the Junge Charité then after having written this, this uh, more or less revolutionary concept paper went on and uh, thought what can we change. And the majority in the group due to the funding source, so Max Eder program or Eminöter program had their protected time and we all thought that every clinician scientist would need protected time in order to be able to follow their scientific passion. And out of these discussions, and uh, you saw the final version of the draft uh, Dr. Lottmann showed before, um, th this the result was the grant application for the clinician scientist pilot program. And this was approved at the end of 2009 and uh, was at this point supported by the Volkswagen Stiftung and the Stiftung Charité by the Excellence Private Excellence Initiative of Johanna Quant and was immediately also supported by the distinct uh, excellence initiatives in the, in the city, the Berlin-Brandenburg School of Generative Regenerative Therapies, the, the Berlin School of Integrative uh, Oncology and Neurocure. And so in 2011, so exactly a decade ago, we started the pilot clinician scientist program, um, which we called, and uh, Professor Haller already said it, uh, that he was really the role model for a physician scientist, Friedrich Luft. And so we called this, th this program Friedrich Luft Clinical Scientist Pilot Program. And Friedrich Luft actually really participated actively in the program in the beginning years. He offered to the first generation a journal club on a, on a bi-weekly base and everybody was there, was discussing papers. And, I, and this is a, just a picture from, from this time and you can easily recognize Professor Luft. And then in 2012, this idea was um, awarded by a prize, Prize Deutschland, Land der Ideen, and I brought this picture with you, and you can recognize on the left side in red uh, Johanna Quant, on the right side Annette Grüters Kieslich, the former dean and strong supporter of the program in the in the early days, and Professor Frey, who really supported us over the first decade of the program. And Duschka in the middle with, the, with, the, with actually the prize, the award, um, Deutschland Land der Ideen. Then in 2012, we had the first international symposium and from there on every other year, we had um, a symposium and I brought some uh, impressions from this first symposium. And the point I'd like to make with these impressions is a point we didn't expect when we planned, when we structured the program. And I'm going to show you what I mean. So this is Dushka actively discussing, as we all know her. Um, and then this is the room uh, in the Humboldt Credit School. Um, and then we see here uh, a neurosurgeon who just recently became chair of neurosurgery in Frankfurt. Then we see an oncologist. Then we see a gastroenterologist and cardiologist, Peter Bobert, neuro the neurosurgeon again, and an anesthesiologist. So what you can appreciate from this, from this view is that we had a very strong interdisciplinary team and what we created was a new network within Charité, a new peers group, which was 
interdisciplinary and facilitated and started programs and research projects which would ne never have happened um, before. And here Georg Duda, who was strongly and is still strongly supporting uh, the, the program. And here Friedrich Luft and Vitushka. So then in 2013, so after initial, the initial funding phase of the Volkswagen Stiftung, we had to do something. And luckily, uh, <coughs> the BIH developed. And the uh, clinician scientist program was renamed and was integrated in the BIH and from 30, 2013 on it was called the BIH Charité Clinician Scientist um, Program and was is funded since from the Charité faculty, the BIH as well as the uh, Stiftung Charité. Then in 2014, and I'm coming to this in one of the next slides, we started the Junior Clinician Scientist uh, Program and in these early days, and this is a picture taken at one of our summer festivities, um, is Dr. Günther Jonitz, the former president of the Berlin Chamber of Physicians. And Günther is really, was from the very beginning, a very strong supporter that we should implement the clinician scientist program in the regular residency without loss of time and till today the Berlin Chamber of Physicians is a strong partner for our program and many thanks for this at here at this point and I think this is a very nice picture of uh, Günther Junitz and, and uh, Dushka. So here th those are th here presented are the pathways uh, that developed then in 2014-15 in and the junior clinician scientist program which includes 20% protected time over two years in the first three years of the residency and the real clinician scientist program starting after the, after the common trunk, so after the first three years of the residency uh, for three years, 50% protected time, a structured curriculum, and I'm coming to this in a second, um, a clinical and a scientific mentor and a clear target agreement. So a number of things then happened over the upcoming years. Uh, the, the program was integrated in the Berlin uh, in the Biomedical Innovation Academy. Um, the, we started presenting the program at the GAIN conference and uh, a number of, and the first retreat happened at the castle uh, Genshagen, which really is the retreat for the program, has been the retreat for the program ever since. And I'm showing pictures in the end. When we now look what really happened in the program, and I think this is best shown in this picture here, and in red you see, in red you see the junior clinician scientist, in blue you see the clinician scientist, and in yellow and green the digital clinician scientist and junior clinician scientist track. And um, I think those are really impressive numbers when we look back and uh, you can see by the number of alumni that the community of clinician scientists is, is continuously uh, growing. But this also indicates that this net cannot be done by a group of three or four people <coughs> and we need more support for this. And this is the overall board um, of the program at the moment and in blue are all board members of the regular clinician scientist program in green are the members of the that are members of the clinical and the digital clinical and the yellow ones are the digital clinician scientist board members but you can see if you look closely there's that many clinical directors and head of institutions are participating in this program because we all know that we need the program in order to succeed as university medicine at the charité but also this group of institutional directors would not be able to organize tightly selection processes and everything, the small things and the big things and organizational part in, in, in the background, which is, which is definitely more important than, than our work up front. And this is done by the team Dushka established over the years, the, BI, the B, so called BIA team. And you can see all the heads here. And um, all the team has really been a, a, an absolute great help and support, in particular already over the last year, where we have had to 
improvise and to, to help Dushka and support Dushka. And now we, we, we do everything to keep things together. And now really uh, Natalie Huber and Ivan Mai are the people who are substituting Dushka and doing their best. <coughs> <coughs> For the, when we take a, s a short look, excuse me, at the, <coughs> at the clinical clinician scientist curriculum, we have several modules, and the modules include the scientific project, obvi obviously the residency, the integration in the scientific community of the project, and also interdisciplinarity. We have several measures for interaction with a sure fix on a monthly base, hot topic seminars, clinician scientists symposium, and our annual retreat. <coughs> and the curriculum includes <coughs> key competences that are named here and are expanded on the need and on demand of our clinician scientists. So the clinician scientists, how do, we how do we control that we have really the quality we like? We have target agreements with every single clinician scientist. We have feedback talks, annual progress report, and prospective meeting where they want to go with their, with their career. In addition, over the years, we s two years ago, we started implementing for the selection process and the, and the um <coughs> project, um, the the quest criteria and a semi-automatic track record analysis for the selection process. <coughs> this is shown here in the uh, in the track record, in the heat maps you see on the right hand side, and the left hand shows the track record, in the middle the project evaluation, and on the right hand side the presentation, and then we get a heat map which helps us to select the clinician scientists. Last, but probably very important, the external evaluation is key and thus we started this process and we will come back to this later today. Additional structural measures include uh, family friendliness, <coughs> which we started in 2017. So also being a part-time e employee, you can become a clinician scientist. <coughs> Um, we implemented the excellent track in 2019, meaning if you're an Eminuta Fellow, Krebshilfe Fellow, Volkswagen Stiften Fellow, you can get integrated in the program without, uh, without the application process or selection process. 2019, we included the Digital S Clinician Scientist track funded by the German Research Foundation. And in 2019, we also implemented the clinical uh, scientist button in the PEP system. So PEP system is the personal planning system uh, of, the, of the duty system of the Charité. So if you are off for the day for the clinical clinician scientist program, you get the pet, PEP button, the clinician scientist button in, your, in the PEP system. And, and this has been proven to be very helpful to make sure that the, the protected time is really protected. And last year, and this was a big project for Dushka over the last two or three years, to start and initiate the Advanced Clinician Scientist Program. And really, with her support until the end of November, we started the Advanced Clinician Scientist Pilot Program and selected the first uh, fellows in the, last, in the last month. And just recently, uh, really, over the, in the last weeks, we started to implement dental medicine as a new tract in our program, which is supported in this initial phase by the Harne Stiftung. So additional, some additional comments before I come to the end. Um, Dushka was very active and tried to communicate our efforts, our plans, our structural ideas, and was part in the working group from the Medizinischen Fakultätentag, in the working group on clinician scientists in 2018. Uh, she reported the program in the federal parliament. Um, she initiated the program, um, the project, structural effect, to evaluate the structural effects of the clinician scientist program together with the Institute of 
Medical Sociology and Rehabilitation Science. And we published just a couple, well, basically two weeks ago, we published the first external program evaluation results. And I think this is going to be very important because we need to show that we really improve something and that we have a positive effect on medical faculties with these programs. So in a short summary of all our programs are visualized here, starting from graduate schools during um, medical studies, junior clinician scientist program, clinician scientist program, and advanced clinician scientist program. And you could say, well, you don't have to exit anywhere. You can go from sta clinic medical studies until you retire. And I think this is a fear some people have for the program, but we have to say that a large number of our fellows actually spend time abroad, come back, and then are really appreciating being able to enter such a program and follow their, their individual projects. And you could also say that um, a clinician scientist program is in particular important for, uh, for a small subset of clinical specialities. And I think I'd like to demonstrate the opposite with this slide. And you can see the different specialties shown on the bottom. And of course, the highest ones is neurology, followed by oncology, gastroenterology, cardiology. But then you can see the general um, and visceral surgery. You can see cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, psychiatry. So really, all specialties are included here in this, in this program. And the other question is, what is the benefit for, the, for a medical faculty? You could say, well, we are only spending money to finance all these clinician scientists. But with this slide, I'd like to prove you the opposite. And um, so while we've roughly spent 21 million euros in these people, in our clinician scientists, we, the faculty got back roughly 50 million uh, euros of third party uh, funding, the majority coming from the German Research Foundation and the BMBF and other foundations as well as the European Union. So I think this illustrates very nicely that we are supporting the right people and that those are the scientists who really do translational sci science um, in our in at the Charité. I'd like to f finish with a couple of pictures and this is the annual retreat at the stairs uh, at the castle in Genshagen and um, everybody who's shown here on this uh, picture is really courageous because the temperatures in Genshagen are always freezing so um, uh, uh, just a few are really wearing uh, um, a jacket and you can have a look just focus on the number of people standing there so this was 2017 this is um, 20, um, 2019, and you see that the, the, this, uh, the, 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 the stairs are already getting a little bit crowded. And this, is, this has been last year, Feb uh, January, and which was really, so Genshagen got really a little bit too full. And, uh, but I think this is a very good sign because the community is growing. With this, I'm, I'm here with Dushka, and we promised uh, Dushka in the last uh, weeks and over the last year of her life that we, and we is the board of clinician science, of board of, of the clinician scientist program, we is the BIA team, that we will definitely keep her thoughts, her ideas, and will continue her work and will further develop the work, and I think we have already done so. Um, in the beginning of this year. When Dushka died, um, I think um, many people wanted to say something personal also to the close family, and this was a little bit difficult at this time, also due to COVID. And so we opened a condolence book um, virtually in a, in, a private, in a private way, and we now printed all these messages and translated them for Dushka, Dushka, Dushka's parents. And I just hold the book here uh, in, the, in the camera. And I know that the book arrived uh, in the last days in Zagreb, so you already have the book. And uh, Tanya and Igor will get the book as well. So you know all the thoughts the close friends from Charité had for Dushka. Still, 
it's me looking back over the last 10 years and I cannot tell you what the clinician scientists actually thought of Dushka. And for this reason, we show next a couple of statements from clinician scientists and their what we call Dushka moments. With this, I'd like to change to the Dushka moments. Thank you. Dear Duska Dragoon, as a junior clinician scientist, I just wanted to thank you for your support by developing this program with all your commitment. There was not just this one moment to mention here because every contact was positive and always very encouraging. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eva Schritzenmeier and I'm part of the clinician scientist program since 2015. It followed me throughout my career and helped me combining research and clinics. I think these times feel strange for many of us and it feels even stranger that Duska is not behind one of that screens at home now and that she does not tell us to turn on our videos and be part of the discussion here. In my head, she's still there telling me to sit in the front row, turn on the video, ask questions, even though I would prefer not to. Dear Duschka, when I joined the Department of Hematology and Oncology at the Virchow site in 2014, our clinic was in a floating state between departure of the former and arrival of a new medical director certainly some kind of a difficult time point for early career researchers. In 2014, I also joined the Clinician Scientist Program and you encouraged me to become an independent research group leader. We got to know each other during my rotation to the Nephrology Department. Thank you very, very much for teaching me mechanisms of allograft reaction, opening new avenues and introducing me to the Berlin Science Hub. You were there when young clinician scientists need independent advice. Thank you very much, Frederick. Duska Dragoon is for me the Gesicht and the Seele of the Clinician Scientist Program. Her Lücke will be very, very difficult to fill, and she will be with me personally as a leader for ever to remain. Hello, my name is Anne Cho, and I'm a part of the Junior Clinician Scientist Program. I would like to take a moment to thank Professor Dragoon for creating this clinician scientist program to support young clinician scientists. I was always astonished how she managed to remember all of our names and our projects. Um, so thank you, Professor Dragoon, for creating this opportunity for us. The last time we saw each other was at the GAIN conference in San Francisco. We chatted over coffee and once again, I was amazed. How did she do it? How did she remember every phase, every project, all the ups and downs that she encountered? How did she always know how to get just to the core of the issue and offer the best advice? My guess is that was deeply rooted kindness paired with that exceptional intellect of hers. She just genuinely cared about you. My name is Annette Künkele. I'm an attending at the Department for Pediatric Oncology and Hematology with Professor Eckert. I was part of the Clinician Scientist program from 2015 till 2018 and I got back from the States end of 2014. And the Clinician, Clinician Scientist program was one of the reasons for me to choose um, the Charité. And I think you cannot um, talk about a Clinician Scientist program without mentioning um, Dushka Dragoon. I experienced her as a really determined mentor who never got tired in telling us that the things we want to achieve we need to achieve by ourselves and we need to fight for that. And you always realized that the program, but especially the people of the program, so we, the clinician scientists, were really, really important to her and um, I think she achieved a lot for us and I will be always thankful for that. Hi, my name is Tatsuma Leitzke. 
I'm currently a fellow of the BIH Clinician Scientist Program and formerly the Junior Clinician Scientist Program. I got to know Dushka almost four years ago, in 2017, when our department back then only had one clinician scientist, that was Johannes Keller, who is now a professor and head of the Experimental Traumatology Unit in hamburg ettendorf We both vividly remember the meetings we had with Dushka, where she repeatedly told us that there's always a way and nothing is ever set in stone. These words still encourage me today to follow a scientific and maybe unconventional path in orthopedics and traumatology. So thank you for everything and know that you're duly missed. So hello, my name is Lorenz Bastian. I'm with Claudia Baldus in Hematology and Oncology at the University Hospital Schleswig-Holstein in Kiel now. So greetings from the north from both of us. We have built a new group here to continue our work on functional genomics of acute leukemias. I think um, there are not many people who have established a new profession and Dushka Dragoon definitely is one of them. When I started my training, science still happened in the weekends and in the evenings besides the work on the ward. And when I entered the program in 2015, we always had to explain what a clinician scientist is. Right now, being here in Kiel, we have six clinician scientists in the lab and on the ward. And for the younger colleagues, it's a completely normal career track. This would definitely not have happened without all this energy, persistence and um, real personal dedication, which Dushka had put into making Berlin a model for this new way to integrate clinical training and scientific interest. Personally, I was most impressed with Duska's unique gift to see something special and, and interesting in absolutely every project, so much that she really stayed in close contact and looked for ways to support every project, even when the program has already more than a hundred members. Hallo, ich heiße Christian Schinke und arbeite in der Neurologie. Ich habe Duska Dragoon 2019 zum Junior Clinician Scientist Programm kennengelernt. Und kurz nach der Veranstaltung fasste sie im Flurgespräch meinen Vortrag mit einer einzigen Geste zusammen. Das war sowas wie... Und sie meinte danach, man hätte die Energie des Vortrags sofort gemerkt. Das hat mich damals sehr motiviert und ermutigt. Und darüber hinaus fand ich das wahnsinnig authentisch und sympathisch und war dementsprechend ein wirklich schöner Moment, der mir im Gedächtnis blieb. Dafür ganz herzlichen Dank. My personal favorite Dushka moment was at my first clinician scientist retreat at Schloss Genshagen, where I was quite nervously asking the speaker a question using the German formal Z. Following the question, um, uh, the session, Dushka dashed up to me with a very serious look on her eyes, um, saying, Elise, please, we're not at some conservative um, district association meeting here. We're using do. And um, followed by a Dushka grin in her face. I will always remember that um, moment. Thank you all for being here today and help us celebrate Dushka's life and share our grief at her passing. My name is Katharina Braune. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist in training, digital clinician scientist fellow and former spokesperson of the junior clinician scientist program. And when I think of Dushka as a mentor, but also as a person, I remember how enthusiastic she was to make us all succeed, be genuine and love what we're doing. She was our guiding light and inspired us not only as researchers, but also as future mentors. She generously supported us with her knowledge, time, energy and skills, but also inspired us to pay it forward and support future generations of doctors and researchers the way she did. Our hearts are with Dushka's family and friends in these difficult times. She will be remembered and continue to be a role model for all of us clinician scientists. My name is Michael Launsbach and I'm a Junior Clinician Scientist Fellow from the Clinic for Pediatrics, the Department of Oncology. It was only last year that I started my fellowship, so I did not get many chances to get to know Mrs. Professor Dragoon personally. 
Nevertheless, today I want to express my deepest admiration for her work for realizing the clinician scientist program here in Berlin. It was only recently that I realized that the opportunities these programs offer to us young researchers were one of the main reasons why I decided to start my academic career here in Berlin and for that, for being able to now call Berlin my new home, I wanted to express my gratitude and say thank you. Hello, my name is Andreas Horn and I would also like to use this opportunity to thank um, Professor Dragoon for this amazing service that she provided to the char charity research and clinical environment here in Berlin. Um, it helped my career uh, substantially in the, in the right time and um, the support uh, the, the, the program has given me would not have been possible without her engagement. So um, I think all of us will remember her um, going forward as a very kind, very motivated, engaged and amazing colleague. And um, it's a great loss um, that we, we did lose uh, Duska um, uh, this year. So thank you again. I first met Dushka during the presentations for my own application to become a junior clinician scientist. I was sitting there and waiting for my turn to present and defend my application and I was trying not to get too nervous. Um, and then I was hearing all the questions the other applicants were asked and there was this really wide variety of topics from hematology to surgery to, to neurology and so on. And sometimes the audience needed to take a while to process the information of the presentation and to form some questions for the applicant, um, but not Dushka. She did not need more time. And what really stood out to me in those moments was how immense her knowledge was and how quick her thoughts were. It was it did not matter what kind of project it was or from which specialty. She always could ask you some profound questions. She would throw in a little joke or two as well. Even more, she knew all the fellows in this huge program by name, especially the new ones. I'm Michaela Golic and I know Professor Dragoon from the Clinician Scientist program in which I took part from 2014 to 2017. Professor Dragoon was an extraordinary mentor. She always knew about my specific situation in clinical training and research and mentored me individually. She had deep knowledge about academic life and was very good in reading persons and analyzing circumstances and situations. And besides this, Dushka was a wonderful, cordial person who was also approachable for personal concerns. Thank you, Dushka. Dear Dushka, with great ambition, we all came to the Charité to combine scientific careers with excellent clinical care. And with your program, we were able to achieve this and we're greatly thankful for this. Dear Dushka, in addition to the personal and academic advancements of each and every one of us, the community of clinician scientists have always been very important for you. As seen in our example, you managed to create real friendships beyond the borders of disciplines, and we want to say thank you. Being a successful basic researcher and cardiac surgeon, a lot of people will tell you that this is impossible, but not Dushka. She believed in this concept and she ultimately believed in me. Thanks to her, I am now able to lead my own research group, be a junior faculty member of the Berlin Center of Advanced Therapies and perform successful cardiac surgery on a daily basis. This is all thanks to the vision of one woman. Dushka Dragu. Thank you so much. I was always very impressed by the commitment and dedication with which Dushka was personally involved with all current and former fellows. I will have been greatly influenced by her enthusiasm in engaging with each other and the world outside of the clinical scientist program. Without her, the community of the clinical scientist program would have been different and we will all sincerely miss Dushka. My name is Julia Sharkowska and I'm from the Department of Neonatology. I want to say thank you, Dushka Dragun, for the possibility to be part of the Clinician Scientist Program. Thanks to this program, I could start a completely new project for me and combine it with my clinical work. It was a great experience. Thank you very much. 
My name is Marcel Naik. I'm from the Department of Nephrology and in the Digital Clinician Scientist Program. I remember Dushka being a helpful advice in the scientific career. She had a really presence of the moment and a kind of aura whenever I talked to her. She was really much engaged into science and in establishing a very good program that we are now a part of and uh, she will be very much missed at the BIH and also for the scientific community. I first met Dushka during a joint project with the lab when I was doing my MD as a student. I got to know her as an inspiring woman combining both patient care and research. She encouraged me to take part in the clinician scientist program and accompanied me on my way. I will always keep her memory with great respect and deep thankfulness. Dushka is a person who was just uh, an incredible supporter for everyone. You could always come and walk up to her with a research project or just a, just a question for help or for advice. She would, she would always be there for, for younger colleagues and always have advice or contact, have an idea how to solve, solve problems. And I'm, she just made an incredible impact on the lives and careers of so many young doctors uh, who she's supported. She really is dearly missed. One of the special moments that I've kept in my memory was um, from one of my first retreats and Dushka held a lecture on the development of the program and between all the formal content she um, was presenting a slide showing a um, statistical analysis from the children of the clinician scientists and then she said the family is growing. And that is the kind of person that she was. She saw not only our work and our projects, but she also took the time to um, see what else is going on in our lives. And I really wish that I could have introduced her to my son, Carl. Thank you. It's a, a great honor to be asked to provide a scientific overview of the wonderful career uh, of Professor Dr. Dushka Dragoon. I'm greatly honored to be asked to provide this uh, for the 10th anniversary of the Berlin Institute of Health's Charité Clinician Scientist Program. I am uh, Professor Dr. Toby Coates. I'm the uh, Director of Transplant uh, at the, here at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'm the Associate Editor for Kidney International uh, for Transplantation and Director of Transplant. Uh, and the past president of the Transplant Society of Australia and New Zealand. But more importantly, I've been a friend and colleague of Dushka's um, for the last 20 years. And so I was very honored to be asked to give this talk. This uh, of course is uh, Dushka uh, doing exactly as she uh, was most famous in doing. And that is uh, presenting uh, two students and this particular photograph I think comes from the fifth anniversary of the Berlin uh, Institute of Health Clinician uh, Scientist Program. I wanted to talk and explain her, the background and how the, the world, the transplant world existed uh, before uh, Dushka uh, came along because uh, it was really quite a different uh, transplant world um, before uh, she made her seminal contributions. The major, uh, her major work was this work, which is the angiotensin type one receptor activating antibodies uh, in kidney allograft rejection, which was an important paper um, that she published uh, in the New England Journal. And what I would like to do is explain to you uh, how this paper worked, because really this is uh, her major, one of her major contributions. And it's a perfect example of her approach, which was going from, uh, the, the bed to the bench, and then from the bench back to the bed. So the whole circle of um, her scientific career was based around identification of clinical concerns, investigating them in the laboratory, and then bringing them back to the patient. And that, of course, is the, the, the mission and the, uh, the job of the Berlin uh, Institute of Health Clinician Scientist Program. 
So in the world before uh, Dushka existed, the only antibodies that were thought to have been of any significance were antibodies to the human leukocyte antigens or the, the HLA. Uh, and these were set up, uh, originally identified by Paul Terasaki uh, in 1969 uh, as an important cause for early uh, graft loss in papers that were published also uh, in the New England Journal. And so the idea that other uh, antibodies that might be relevant uh, for transplantation and would exist uh, outside uh, of the HLA system was indeed something that was quite, quite unusual. What we know now uh, is that uh, transplantation itself of the kidney or of any of the solid organs um, is a stress which uh, alters uh, the way cells perform uh, and therefore exposes uh, targets for immunity that had not previously been, been recognized. We recognize now that the microenvironment, uh, ischemia reperfusion injury, the drugs that we use, such as the calcium neuron inhibitors, are all things that can upregulate receptors on the surface of transplant cells. And in Dushka's particular case, uh, this was the angiotensin type one receptors, which he first uh, described and talked about. And what was important is uh, to recognize in this fluid concept that she had was that these antibodies could potentially have uh, differential effects on the receptors so that it might be uh, that you might see uh, upregulation and gain of function or potentially with stimulation of the AT1 receptors down regulation. And this meant therefore that there were really three phenotypes where the angiotensin receptor could be stimulated and produce no significant injury. It could be stimulated and produce an intermediate phenotype or indeed, uh, as we were, came to recognize, there could be very severe full-blown injury, which would result in, in a devastating uh, clinical phenotype. So how she did this uh, essentially was to notice uh, and take an observation from the clinic. What she noticed was that the biopsies that she had seen uh, in the clinic for patients who had severe antibody-mediated rejection looked very similar to the biopsies of patients that she'd seen with scleroderma or indeed in patients who'd had uh, preeclampsia. And so uh, in a manner that she used to describe as being like Agatha Christie's um, hero detective in a Miss Marple manner, um, she said, what looks like uh, the pathology in preeclampsia or looks like the pathology uh, in scleroderma could be the pathology of what's happening in some of our transplant patients. And at that time, there was a recognition that potentially uh, the angiotensin receptors may be playing a role, particularly uh, in scleroderma and in, in preeclampsia. So what she did, and this is shown very nicely in her New England Journal paper from 2005, was to take serum um, from patients with uh, severe uh, vascular injury uh, biopsies and then stimulate them uh, on a classic uh, cardiomyocyte assay, which is shown up here. And what you can see, here's the control on one side and the control on the other. But when uh, serum from patients with this difficult situation was used to stimulate these cells, you can see the muscle contracting. She was then able to show using the angiotensin receptor blocker, Lasartan, uh, which is shown over here, that it was possible to completely block the effect uh, of uh, these uh, angiotensin receptor antibodies. And likewise, with an irrelevant antibody over here, she showed that it was absolutely specific to the angiotensin type one receptor antibodies. The pathology is shown down here uh, of the vascular lesion. And then the concept therefore, once uh, she found a number of patients with this condition was then to be able to take antibodies from patients with the clinical phenotype, give it to rats and reproduce the injury in the rat model showing again that it was transfer of the antibodies from the serum of the patients that produced the disease phenotype. So this was classical back from bench to bedside um, research. And I remember because she and I were postdoctoral scientists uh, at the same time, and we used to meet on a regular basis at uh, the international transplant meetings. And so I was uh, in contact with her as this process was unfolding. And it took, and this is for the benefit of, of uh, clinician scientists watching this, uh, this video, um, this bench uh, to bedside uh, approach took several years to reach its full conclusion. And indeed, when the paper was originally sent to the New England Journal, the uh, reviewers of the New England Journal replied to her saying, 
well, that's fine. And now we want to show that uh, these antibodies, by treating them, that you can improve the situation clinically. And that's exactly what she had to do. So if we go through this slide here, you can see the angiotensin type 1 receptor antibodies, typically the IgG1 or IgG3, stimulate uh, the angiotensin type 1 receptor uh, to produce uh, inflammation, rejection, and coagulopathy. And therefore, treatments that might be directed at removing those antibodies, be it uh, antagonistic treatments such as blockade with the angiotensin receptor blockers uh, or removal, passive removal of antibody using um, plasmapheresis, make logical treatments to do this. And that's exactly what she did. So here is a small um, study um, where she treated uh, patients with this uh, intensified plasma exchange, receptor blockade and increasing immunosuppression. And you can see people who had the angiotensin receptor antibody who were treated had excellent graft survival over two years, whereas patients who were untreated had much worse graft survival. And so this therefore is therapeutic proof of concept that intervening on these antibodies in the absence of anything else could change the phenotype. So what we now know uh, very much uh, is that uh, the target of these antibodies uh, is the angiotensin type one receptor. And this is a ribbon cartoon here to show you the receptor, which is a seven protein uh, transmembrane domain protein, uh, GPR, uh, as you can see shown in the, in the cartoon. And the target for these uh, antibodies are the extracellular loops. And the extracellular loop antibodies which form bind uh, and stimulate either the IgG1 or the IgG3, and then can produce uh, a functional effect uh, on, on these receptors. And I'll also point out that the binding site of the uh, other uh, tree treatments such as valsartan and angiotensin II binding is different to these extracellular domains which are present and become the target of these naturally formed autoantibodies. So uh, it was important therefore once she'd shown this then to try to do more basic research to work out the, the mechanism of why, these, of why this happened. And this is uh, the work that she did which uh, essentially showed that uh, stimulation uh, of the, the extracellular uh, membrane domains of the angiotensin type 1 receptor altered uh, in endothelial cells produced activation of stress kinases, ERK1, ERK2 in the vascular smooth muscle cells, which uh, resulted in translocation of transcription factors, in this particular uh, case, NF kappa B, which uh, produced acute rejection, upregulation of uh, MCP1 and RAN tests, and ultimately then activation of tissue factor and coagulation. And that very nicely produced this phenotypic biopsy, which you can see over here, where there is a, a vascular thrombosis within the, the side uh, of, the, of the rejecting patient with the cells infiltrating uh, into the interstitium. So what was interesting then uh, further about this was that uh, these particular types of rejection that were mediated by these angiotensin receptor antibodies uh, were in fact uh, C4D negative. So unlike uh, the conventional HLA antibody rejection, which of course uh, produces C4D positivity, that is complement deposition within the, uh, the tissue of the graft, uh, for these rejections, only a third of these patients had positive C4D biopsies. And so she really introduced the first concept, which has now been taken up and looked at other forms of uh, antibody mediated rejection being uh, a C4D negative antibody mediated rejection. And if you like now, the concept of antibody mediated vascular injury. And this was work that was done with a number of uh, very prominent uh, uh, transplant immunologists around the world, and including in this particular case, uh, Elaine Reed uh, from the University of uh, California in Los Angeles uh, campus, with whom she had a lifelong uh, friendship and a lifelong uh, study involving uh, the effect of antibodies and atypical antibodies on graft outcome. She did lots of work looking to see how uh, the mechanism of um, these atypical uh, antibodies causing rejection worked. And as I've shown you here in this particular cartoon, um, activation of the ERK kinases and activation of NF kappa B was critical in terms of producing cell proliferation, cytokine and tissue factor production. But there were other things that once the receptors were stimulated, uh, we know particularly in combination if there happened to be an HLA antibody present at the same time, was these uh, Vibel uh, Pallade bodies, exocytosis, activation of tissue factor, von Willebrandt's factor, 
and the production of the thrombotic microangiopathy, which is a typical feature of antibody mediated rejection and has something very much in common with what you see in, in uh, scleroderma and also uh, in, in preeclamptic related renal injury. So what she introduced now was this concept that angiotensin receptor antibodies might be uh, important initially in kidney transplants, but now extending this to all sorts of other uh, transplant organs and other tissues. So as we show here, uh, the angiotensin receptor antibodies are important in the endothelial cells and vascular smooth muscle cells. They're also important um, in fibroblasts, in epithelium, uh, and indeed uh, on B cells uh, and other members uh, of the immune system. So that antibodies that occurred against these receptors could potentially be playing a role in a large variety of, of tissue targets. And the concept really then became the active use of angiotensin uh, receptor blockers to stop the binding of these autoantibodies and therefore prevent, uh, prevent the deleterious effects. Um, and you can see this in this cartoon here uh, that sometimes uh, you, can you can see um, a slow and sustained signal signaling uh, through the angiotensin type one receptor antibody. Uh, and sometimes you can see if it's angiotensin two itself um, that you get a rapid and brief um, signal uh, and shorter sim stimulation. For either situation, blocking with the sartan, either valsartan, low sartan, candesartan, any of the sartans is capable of actually blocking the signal, whether it's an angiotensin type one receptor antibody or whether it's the angiotensin uh, type two itself. So a simple therapeutic that we already had in the, in the, in the uh, therapeutic armamentarium was capable of dealing with the downstream consequences um, of these antibodies. So a very effective, cheap uh, intervention that could be applied uh, for the benefit of patients. And this led Dushka to develop the Charité Berlin protocol for treatment of, uh, of AT1 receptor antibody mediated rejection. And based on a large number of tests that she performed, and indeed she had to develop her own um, reagents or tools to detect uh, the antibodies. And in this particular case, uh, the beads that are, do, that are able to detect the angiotensin type one receptor antibodies and an ELISA that was able to do it. She worked out that there was a threshold effect uh, above which uh, rejection occurred and below which uh, it was not quite so necessary to treat. Uh, and the magic number is uh, 17 international units. And so with this particular protocol that I show you here that Dushka developed, um, if the AT1 receptor antibodies were greater than 17, preemptive um, plasma exchange uh, pre-transplant induction with antithymocyte globulin or thymoglobulin, and then standard triple therapy to chrolimus, mycophenolate and steroids um, with a sartan, uh, was the, the logical strategy that needed that needed to occur. And if patients just had uh, levels that were greater than uh, 10, but lower than 17, then often purely treatment just with an angiotensin receptor blocker would be capable of mediating a positive therapeutic effect. So this is a photograph of uh, Dushka's lab uh, when I visited her uh, a number of years ago, and you can see all of the members um, in her group. Uh, she ran a, a large, busy, uh, transplant research lab uh, in beautiful uh, Berlin and was a very good mentor, particularly to um, all young people, but also particularly to uh, young female, either doctors or basic scientists. And much of her career was spent uh, encouraging other people. And this of course would re reach its ultimate fruition uh, with the Berlin Institute of Health Clinician Scientists program. So I've put together a number of uh, papers uh, from her, the many papers that she published, well over uh, 100 original contributions to the literature, just to indicate some of the things that she was doing and some of the collaborators and prominent people in transplant that, that have uh, been involved with the story of the angiotensin receptor antibodies, in addition to other atypical antibodies, because Dushka really was the pioneer in this field. And you can see here this paper, um, which was published in Transplantation a number of years ago. Um, you can see uh, Bob Montgomery, um, Mary Sue LaFell, Andrea Zachary, uh, and Annette Jackson, all of whom are key people in uh, tissue typing and transplantation uh, in the United States, who were very much uh, involved and on board as this story was uh, unfolding, uh, led by Dushka from, from Berlin. She also published uh, a number of important papers um, with us in Kidney International, 
Uh, this is a paper in KI from a few years ago uh, with other prominent people, this time from France. So here is Carmen uh, Le Facheur uh, as the first author, who is a lifelong friend uh, of Dushka's and another scientist, Aurélie, Aurélie Philippe uh, from uh, Dushka's lab, um, Christophe Legendre, uh, key French transplanter, Alex Lupi, uh, a big uh, uh, proponent uh, from the Paris Transplant Group who's taken on uh, the legacy of Dushka's work, uh, Phil Halloran, uh, of course, from, from Alberta in Canada, and, and Denny Glotz, uh, also from, uh, from Paris, France, uh, with Dushka as the senior author. She was certainly uh, interested in looking at mechanism, um, and she was very interested in the G protein coupled receptors and how autoantibodies, uh, other different autoantibodies might be important in terms of uh, disease processes. And so looking uh, at this particular paper, which was published most recently here uh, in Nature Communications, she was able to actually, again, look at other different types of autoantibodies that were, again, signaling through G-protein coupled receptors to produce uh, physiological and pathological changes in the immune system. She also had a lifelong uh, interest uh, in mTOR inhibitors. And this, again, was brought uh, out from the, from the transplant world. Uh, and so she was very interested in the differential effect uh, of uh, mTORC uh, in terms of uh, inhibition to promote different uh, phenotypic uh, outcomes in cells. And this, of course, uh, was uh, well supported by a longstanding collaboration that she had with Novartis Pharma, um, who supported uh, much of her work uh, and was important in terms uh, of clinical trials that she also undertook. This particular paper, uh, published in Scientific Reports, uh, deals with um, the factors that are important in the development of mesenchymal stem cells and how uh, mTOR inhibitors uh, might be used to potentially um, manipulate these cell formation. One of the other things that she was pivotal in was uh, performing clinical trials. Uh, and this particular trial was a nice trial uh, that Dushka played a very prominent role in, uh, which was an open labeled randomized uh, clinical trial comparing uh, Everolimus and Tacrolimus or Cyclosporin um, in de novo trans uh, kidney transplant patients. So this was a really uh, a real world experience uh, that, that essentially, uh, again, was able to show um, use of mTOR inhibitors giving excellent long-term uh, clinical outcomes. She was interested in targeting uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines um, and did further work um, looking at how uh, vascular endothelium could be uh, influenced uh, under the uremic conditions because at the end of the day, as a clinician scientist, she was interested in problems that related to the problems with the transplant patients and problems with dialysis patients in the clinic. And so basic science, applying basic science to clinical problems was a major thing that she did. And I think one of the most gratifying things uh, for Dushka uh, was to see the field that she pioneered of atypical antibodies uh, being incorporated now into the standard uh, and the, the standard uh, pathological conventions that we have. And this is the BAMF uh, 2019 uh, kidney uh, meeting report. She was delighted and very thrilled to be uh, invited to, to participate with all of these eminent transplanters and make sure that uh, the angiotensin receptor antibodies now are, are uh, and their importance in, in transplant has been highlighted in this major um, pathological uh, meeting. So to mark and to honor uh, Dushka, uh, the International Society of Nephrology and Kidney International um, have uh, produced uh, a, um, an editorial uh, and a large review that summarizes her extensive role uh, of non-HLA antibodies in transplant medicine. This is in press currently uh, in, Kid in Kidney International, and you should be able to find it with the first author of Carmen Le Facheur, uh, which gives a complete overview of all the papers she puzzled, uh, pu published and puts everything into perspective so that you can see for yourselves the tremendous contribution uh, that Dushka made to the basic science uh, in transplantation. So Dushka's uh, legacy, um, I think, is the discovery of a completely new field, the atypical antibodies in transplantation. Not only that, though, um, she was the sort of person uh, that was able then to develop new treatments. And there's no doubt that, that grafts and lives have been saved by this discovery in adult and in pediatric transplant. She was the typical bench to bedside uh, basic scientist, uh, strongly bedded in the, in the clinic, and capable then of translating. So exactly the right sort of person to be involved with the uh, Berlin Clinician Scientist Program and very much um, a leader in the Berlin Scientist Program as its first director. 
And this is her in a very typical way, um, giving lectures. Uh, this particular one uh, was when she came to the Transplantation Society of Australia and New Zealand, and also to the Australian New Zealand Society of Nephrology to lecture. Here she is uh, in Paris with a number of uh, very key transplant people. Um, here in the, at the back uh, is um, Carmen Lefacheur. This is Adriana Zivi, Dushka here, and Denny, Denny Glotz, uh, obviously in Paris, uh, and uh, enjoying one of the many things that she did, which was company of good friends. Uh, here she is uh, out in Australia again uh, with uh, Rhonda Holdsworth uh, and at one of our meetings. And when I most recently saw her uh, before uh, she became unwell, uh, we met up uh, in Paris and this is in uh, Paris here um, uh, about a year and a half ago. She had a lot of um, good friends and she enjoyed very much going out and socializing uh, and she was a great friend to my wife uh, and myself, and we enjoyed very much uh, having uh, fine wine uh, with good friends and with Dushka uh, whenever we could. And it was a feature of uh, very much of our, um, of our friendship. And I think it's important, this is a good way to remember her as an excellent scientist, but also an excellent person uh, with connections in the arts, in the literature, uh, in music, a true Renaissance uh, woman who was capable of, of recognizing and bringing out the best in people as well as uh, finding inspiration for young people. So I'd like to finish with a quote from uh, Dushka's uh, favorite philosopher, Hannah Arendt, um, because Dushka really, Vale Dushka, a true clinician scientist and a changer of paradigm. And I think this quote from Hannah Arendt really summarizes very nicely um, Dushka's uh, clinical achievements and basic scientific achievements. Uh, the new always happens against the overwhelming odds, uh, statistical laws and their probability for which uh, all products and everyday purposes amounts to certainty. And therefore the new will always appear in the guise of a miracle. And certainly patients who've had their grafts salvaged or rejection prevented by the treatments that she developed would I'm sure uh, absolutely agree with, with those sentiments. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to present um, Dushka's uh, scientific legacy. Unfortunately, with the time that I had, it was impossible to cover all of the hundred papers that she had published and therefore I've shown you some highlights only. It was a great privilege to be able to do this uh, on behalf of my friend. Uh, and I hope uh, that you've gained some insight into the tremendous legacy that uh, Dushka has uh, left for those of us uh, in transplantation. We had some minor technical issues. However, the entire talk was recorded and will then in full be available over the web website. And I think what I probably like most about the talk, I know about the science, but the way you describe the person, Dushka, really reflects how, how we also um, I know we also get to, got to know her and the, the, her her her. her uh, that she liked really uh, dinners, large discussions, lively discussions. And I think this really was, uh, Dushka was a friend and was good to have, she, to, to have her as a friend and to be able to discuss various topics starting from literature, philosophy, up to medicine. With this, I'd like again uh, say a, a really warm uh, thank you to, to Australia. And we come to another friend of Dushka and they've been together uh, sharing sharing their career over probably, and Toby, you have to correct me when you start, probably over the last 20 years in nephrology. Um, and Tobias Huber is about the same age as uh, Stushka and he's now director and head of the um, medical nephrology department um, in Universitätsklinikum Hamburg Eppendorf. And um, it's, we're really happy, Toby, to have you here with us this morning and uh, that you're sharing uh, your memories of Tushka and what, what, what are the stories you want to, to tell us. Now we need to see whether the technique perfect. Everything is ready, so um, Toby, the floor is yours. Dear all the good friends of Tushka, Tanya, Igor, and all the others, dear parents of Tushka, um, I think there was, you know, when at, at the end of last year, um, um, 
Dushka mentioned a couple of times, there was for one day she wanted to, she wanted to be around, and this was exactly today uh, at this meeting. It meant so much to her. And while we all have been in, in, in very deep grief for the last six months, I think we witnessed today that Dushka is around and her ideas and her, uh, her inspiration and uh, that drives so many of us and, and all the fellows uh, is very lively and active. And I think this is something uh, that we're all very happy to witness today. I would also use the chance to not only congratulate Dushka and her team, but the whole BIH and Charité for this remarkable development of this program, which became the reference and the national standard for clinician scientists uh, programs, and this which impacted uh, uh, research and medical research throughout um, Germany. And I think it's not just the education of the mentees, but it has been implemented and impacted a whole new culture of communication, exchange, innovation, quality control, and thereby shaping whole uh, university medical centers. And something that is sometimes overlooked is that not just the mentees benefit from it, but also the mentors. Whenever you're mentoring a mentee, the mentor equally benefits from it and, and, and gets new ideas and, 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 and gets a bit more matured. And by this, Dushka certainly became the master of mentors by having mentored so many people. And there were, there were very few people who could have been so sharp, so directly to a point in recognizing things, in, in pointing to directions. And while we have been listening this morning and heard so wonderfully about her personal merits, scientific merits, her whole legacy from all aspects, here, uh, the keynote, uh, uh, was meant now to, to go a step further and, and, and show how much the BIH and, and Charité Clinician Scientist Program and, and the mentorship visit, and particular Dushka as a mentor, also reached out and impacted other programs. And for me personally, having Dushka as a friend, she became a, a very close mentor um, when, when our team um, could build up or try to build up a translational nephrology program in Hamburg over the last four years. Not just a personal mentor, but she also became an official advisor in many of our programs, the transplant program, and also an advisory board member of our educational programs. And this is something, and this is the story that I would like to tell. And it, it starts really with this translation of nephrology, in, which you heard so nicely by Toby Coles already, which was very close to Dushka's heart. And she very nicely uh, summarized this more than five years ago, uh, uh, the major challenges in translation and nephrology. So while nephrology was at the forefront of research in the 70s and 80s, when, when physiology and, and transporters could be uh, uh, studied in the kidney. Um, nephrology fall a bit behind for the last two decades when it came to real translation and as uh, illustrated here by Dushka, uh, the pipeline tried out in new inventions and translations. And this actually, you know, on the contrast, uh, is, is here shown with the huge un, uh, unmet need uh, for, for chronic and, and, and kidney diseases affecting more than 850 million people worldwide. And Dushka's always, you know, if it was about answering such big questions, why did the pipeline try out? Why is there nephrology, is nephrology in, in parts falling behind oncology or other? scientific fields in terms of translating and developing new drugs and treatments. And what Dushka uh, used to say uh, on such issues is try to put scientific questions in a larger context. And she meant even beyond medicine towards philosophy, music, and different fields. And uh, that's what we kind of try to do. So, and by, by putting it on, on, on this larger context, 
uh, we started to think about the need for kidney and translational kidney research by starting at the beginning of the, of the universe and then from there try to go in five steps. So step number one was the Big Bang, the start of the universe, which we now call physics. The second step was the formation of chemical bounds, organic and unorganic bounds, which we now would call chemistry. And then the following by, 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 by the development of membranes, separations, simple life, which we would now call biology. And then certainly key step in biology, in evolutionary biology and the development of species. And in this fourth step, there was one very remarkable situation when life crossed from water to land, uh, which is pictured here. And this pre we visited uh, the, the, the ability and the capacity of life to adjust to very different environments. And this could be done and was enabled by the development of the kidney, by the combination of excess filtration and reabsorption, salts, water, the whole internal environment could be kept very, very stable. And by this actually, uh, the kidneys came the fifth most important step in the development to human being, at least from a nephrocentric, kidney-centric view. Now, this comes at the price, and it, 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 if you look at the structures that Dushka loved so much, the very complex kidney structures and epithelial cells and buildup basically goes along with a relatively, as with all the highly specialized epithelial cells, goes along with, with a very little capacity for regeneration. So once this kidney tissue is getting injured, it tends to progress and gets, uh, and, and, and these epithelial cells gets to be removed by scarring fibrotic tissue. And this comes in, I think, to the key challenges that translational nephrology was facing, and we heard from Toby Coates one example where Dushka herself crossed this barrier when she identified the antibodies in transplantation nephrology. But the problem was always the same. There's these, there's these many, many different cell types, over 25 different cell types, and it's very difficult to bring them in culture. So there are no easy study systems. And from the clinical side, diseases are not very well uh, described and are very heterogeneous, and there was a lack of molecular and a lack of molecular markers. Now, what Dushka said at this time point, and I think it's true, and it's so, she challenged all her fellows, and this large group of fellows that we heard before, there are no limits to hypothesizing, just, just put forward a uh, 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 hypothesis and, 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 and try to come up with new ideas. And Dushka herself put forward, and this is five years old, but it could be really from today, a, a very interesting scheme, and this is from her own slides for translational nephrology, where she basically made it through a picture from observation to a new describing of, of the phenotypes at the molecular level to the design of new studies and, and molecular drugs in targets. Now we tried uh, at our side uh, uh, um, to, to formulate three hypotheses um, in our building up the program um, at, uh, at being advised by Dushka. And, and it was hypothesis number one, it's very important that we clearly define patient cohorts. You're not talking about monogenetic diseases here, we're not talking about clonal expansion as in cancer, but it's really that these kidney diseases are impacted by, by many uh, 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 confounding factors. So we need to be very precise in, in defining these cohorts, number one. Number two, kidney diseases have been previously described just on a level of histology. So there is a need to totally redefine kidney diseases on a single cell, single compartment level, on the level of increased and changed uh, renal cell diversity, on and on the level of three-dimensional interactions from resident cells to immune cells and other cells. 
then I think it's important that we put the kidney in the context of other organs and what is here showing uh, 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 kind of as an inter-organ signaling and map how organs interact with each others. And there's no organ uh, being sick itself. It's always in the context of other organs and each organ disbalance is impacting, influencing other organs. Now we just heard what Vardushka did when she studied uh, antibodies to angiotensin receptors. And she basically joined the Charité with, with structural biology teams to really understand the molecular basis of the interaction of these antibodies to their antigen. And that's what she told and, and what she teached many, many of her mentees and fellows. Use most sophisticated methods to achieve your, your goals. Don't be afraid of, 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 of crossing barriers in using methods and, and, and I would add and if necessary even invent them yourself. And so for the Hamburg program it meant it was very important to have access to data repositories and uh, cohorts and, and tissue and, and there was a national reg registry in place and, and we recruited the European registry of kidney tissue. We built up a Hamburg European Renal Omics Bank and it was in place the world's largest archive of kidney biopsies and we recruited uh, one of the leading people in, as a guest professor in the United States building up the kidney repositories there. Um, and then, of course, this needs to be combined with new techniques to analyze the kidneys as here optical clearing and light sheet microscopy uh, to envision three-dimensional structures and this was done under the leadership of Ali Atak in Munich and uh, uh, parts of our team collaborated to optically clear and illustrate for the first time a whole human kidney, allowing to uh, detect things like neurovascularization. And I think most important for us in reading our biopsies is to, uh, to, was to develop new techniques uh, of multiplex imaging, we now can image up to 100 antibodies at the same time. And by them and by the clusters of these signals form new units to describe and redefine kidney diseases. And this, of course, as anybody does, needs to be uh, 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 um, combined with artificial intelligence. And this is one of the First examples of the kidney um, to use immunofluorescence-based specimen and, and unit-based algorithm, which now allows us to predict based on slight morphological and cellular changes the outcome of later diseases. And of course, uh, going into kidney biopsies and dissolving the tissue to a single cell level. Now, if we understand, and this is the dream that we have and had in, in, in Dushka in particular, if we come down and remap the kidney to certain molecules, pathways, or altered cellular targets, then we also want to target this at the cellular level. And for that, it's important to come up with new techniques allowing to target different kidney tissues and up to a single cell level. And it's where we formed an AAV platform, which now really allows us to target different cell types and compartments within the kidney, very specifically to deliver uh, drugs and, and also genetic manipulation. And now this is kind of a scheme which uh, was shown by, by Dushka, and, and it's very similar that we talked and, and we used the, the platforms that I just mechanical ventilation and also a um, member of a team study the role of resident immune cells. So what would Dushka say? She would say, so what, what does it mean? This is a lot of descriptive studies and, 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 and she would be right. And that's why we kind of try currently to understand more and more molecular pathways uh, at the basis of single cell resolution which tells us actually that there is really a switch in these parenchymal organs and the liver as well as in the kidney that might have implications for the long-term outcome. Quickly, a second example, again, from an observation 
um, that Dushka made in transplant medicine and many others, and, and, and also in stage renal kidney disease, all of our patients with chronic and progressed chronic kidney disease suffer from muscle cachexia. And this is a key issue for, for frailty. Now, the hypothesis would be muscle homeostasis is regulated by the kidney. And this shows um, um, the outcome of the study, uh, which is currently in press. So there is really an old is, is, is animal CKD model. There is a, a shift in the muscle metabolism towards autophagy, protein degradation, and less protein synthesis. And if you then profile the kidney at the same time, it turns out that these progressively diseased kidneys themselves secrete pro factors. So it's the kidney that, when injured, is regulating muscle homeostasis. And uh, with using single cell techniques, this can be shown that it's fibrotic kidney tissue at certain uh, cell populations in the kidney that it that are uh, appearing during kidney disease, particular uh, certain populations of fibroblasts that are secreting the pro uh, cactic factors. And of this translated to humans, and then we can observe that these pro cactic factors are increased in CKD patients. And if we look the correlators uh, to which EFR, and we can see that there is a direct correlation from decreased GFR to increased secretion of these factors. And also from biopsies, we can then uh, identify the same cell types in humans as in animal models. So this sums up to a model. There was a, mo a previous model showing that the kidney regulates other organs. Uh, in this case, the hematopoietic system described by Greg Semenza, Peter Redcliffe, and, and, and William and Caitlin. And, and I think you can add another uh, 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 model to this menu where the kidney directly regulates muscle homeostasis. And of course, and this shows Dushka and, and her team and what they always pushed forward with all the projects that they supervised is a question and it's important that this question is being raised. How can this be translated? What are the next steps? And for us, this is just a proof of concept uh, using our AAE platform that we uh, delete the, 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 the prochacactic receptor on the muscle. And by that, we can fully restore the muscle functionally and morphologically. Now, one of the key points, and this was amazing, part of, of, of Dushka's career, not only at, uh, initially more focusing on her own career and scientific development and, and later more and more focusing on mentoring and building up programs. And, it, and it, the key idea of Dushka was to always put people in the center of all considerations. And I think that's what we just heard from the fellows. The, also the personal caring, taking the perspective of the fellows. What would be the programs not serving the mentors? but serving the fellows and the mentees the most. This was really the idea that very actively drove us in Hamburg. And, and Dushka was also part of our um, officially advisory board uh, of, 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 of some of our programs that we developed. And, and, and it started then that we also, um, it was one of our Dushka's ideas, which he talked commonly about the department structure that we kind of included with the different divisions that we have in our department and we formed new divisions on basic science and, and new groups and also um, tissue related groups, which were very helpful. And then we tried, since we didn't have all these programs in place uh, that we heard about in the Charité, so we, uh, um, we tried to build up uh, and apply for an for an MD thesis program, um, and we, we included an M, MD clinician scientist program in our SFB, and and now uh, uh, as a team we successfully applied for the BNBF program for advanced clinician scientists, and let me just show a few things, and 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 we really that follow Dushka's idea, put the people in the centers so of our. MD program, this uh, um, um, supported by the Else Gröner Promotionscollegium, it followed the idea that all the mentors have also to apply their projects and have to show up and have to actively compete for the mentees uh, in, in series of, of speed dating sessions. And by that, ensuring really 
from the perspective of a mentee, the highest qualities of projects. Uh, for the clinician scientist program, it meant that we can enable within our SFB people that stay 12 months in the clinics, then go on into basics in our basic science programs and from there um, apply for own funding. And for the most recent advanced clinician scientists program, um, um, it was again the idea, and, 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 and I remember when we talked last October about this with, uh, with Dushka, and I was saying, oh, it's, you know, writing these programs, and what, what can we do new, what has not been described before? And she said, you know, well, Toby, simple thing, think from the people, think from, from the perspective of followers, what would be the best for them? And that's what we tried uh, actually to, to follow and, and came up with some ideas of a kind of a translational research clinic where, where, where these advanced clinical scientists will be appointed um, with their own team and tandem partners out of the clinics to for their secured free time and so on. Now, this kind of uh, sums this up uh, where we kind of gained a little bit of a kidney-centric view in, 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 in Hamburg, in, in, in this newly built center, Hamburg Center for Kidney Health. But what it really was, it was an example for how these programs and how Dushka herself impacted and influenced many things far beyond the reach of the Charité. And um, this is actually slide number 51. This is the age that uh, Dushka would still be today. And I really love looking at these pictures, uh, at these group photos um, um, with, with, with her classes, because I think they kind of symbolize Dushka in the front as this um, fearless, unique, uh, sometimes brutally honest, but always empathic leader that lifted all these fellows step by step with stair by stair along their career and that made such impact in these programs and on the and, and on the people and and the, really the lesson that we learned it's about personal connection personal empathy uh, personal caring these are the things that persist more than any vanity fairs. And the question will be, so how will this continue? And the program, as we heard today, is unstoppable. It will continue to be a success, but it will be different without Dushka. With that, um, thank you, Dushka. Thank you all for being here and listening. Um, and I'm giving back to Greta. Thanks, Toby, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture and pointing out first, I think, two points you made. First, the role of the mentor, I think, an always underestimated role. And I think this became also very clear throughout the videos we've seen from our clinician scientists today, how important the mentors are in, this, in, the, in, in these programs. And the second point you made is how far the, the impact from Dushka's idea reached and they were certainly relevant outside of Berlin and I think this point was made clear in a very, in a very nice way by, by your talk. Thank, thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. I'd like to sum up a little bit this morning session. First of all, I like everybody, all speakers uh, who compete and, and all piece, uh, persons behind the curtain who contributed to making this first session possible today. I know that we had a number of minor or not so minor technical issues. However, all talks will be available online afterwards. So don't be frustrated if you, wouldn't, if you weren't able to listen to one or the other talk. The good news is that by 1 p.m. the line hopefully is much stronger. So by then we should be able to stream on a very stable, in a very stable way. So let's hope for this at 1 p.m. So by this, I'd like to send you all to a well-earned um, break, um, get something to eat, refresh your, uh, refresh your coffee, 
feel free to visit the memorial room on the on the website and i think the interaction platform um, which you probably have detected which is also on the link we've provided on the lab uh, on the on the website there is a network function where you can share and, vi and visit other people uh, in a virtual way. It's, it's quite, I think it's a quite exciting idea and it's the best way to meet currently, currently other people. With this, I'd, uh, I'd close the f I'm happy to close the first uh, session um, uh, and wish us all a very nice break and happy to welcome everybody back at 1 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>